Good morning. Today we cover the topic of understanding evolution through the development of scientific theory, as well as explore its historical underpinnings. Let's get started. All living organisms on Earth are related through a common ancestry, but how did this all happen? And how do we know this? In this lecture, um, I will explore the history of scientific thinking that has led to our current understanding of biological evolution. Charles Darwin obviously features quite prominently in this lecture. However, Charles did not come up with this biological evolution out of the blue. His ideas were strongly influenced by many thinkers from many different scientific disciplines. In this lecture, we will look into these questions and ask, First, how did the theory of evolution come to be? Second, what was Darwin's contribution to the theory of evolution? In other words, why is he so famous? And third, what has happened since Darwin in the development of our understanding of evolution? Let's start by going back to 1831 and joining Charles Darwin on the HMS Beagle. As we discussed in the previous chapter, Scientists start by making observations and asking questions. The story of Charles Darwin and the theory of evolution is no different. In 1831, a young Charles Darwin, who was only 22 years old, joined the crew of the HMS Beagle for a five-year voyage around the world. The Beagle sailed from England around the tip of South America to the Galapagos Islands, around the southern coast of Australia and Africa, and back to England. During this journey, Darwin collected thousands of samples of plants, animals, fossils, and rocks. He made careful and important observations about the organisms he encountered. For instance, Darwin spent a considerable amount of time studying the plant and animal life that inhabited the Galapagos Islands, which is shown here. In particular, Darwin noticed that different kinds of birds, finches in particular, were quite variable, and different kinds of finches lived on different islands. But the variation was not random. It appeared to vary according to the habitat in which they lived. In other words, particular birds were adapted for very specific environments. He was puzzled and intrigued by this pattern of variation. A great scientist asked great questions, and Darwin was a great scientist. He wondered about many of the things he saw during his five-year voyage on the Beagle. Those birds, for example, puzzled Darwin. Here's an example of four different species of finch that Darwin collected on different islands in the Galapagos. Darwin observed that these different bird species were adapted to eat very particular foods and live in very particular environments on those islands. How did this happen? As we'll see, Darwin surmised that birds with certain physical features, those that allowed them to eat certain foods in their environment, survived and reproduced. Through reproduction, they could pass on those physical features to their offspring, thus increasing the frequency of those features in the overall population of birds. And in different environments, different physical features would be favored and would be selected this idea, termed natural selection, is the driver of evolution, or as Darwin phrased it, quote, descent with modification, end quote. From a single common ancestor, many different kinds of species of birds could evolve because different physical features are favored in different environments. The 13 different finch species that currently live in the Galapagos is the kind of rapid and prolific speciation known as adaptive radiation. Great ideas in science rarely emerge without considerable contributions from previous generations of great thinkers, and natural selection is no exception. To understand how natural selection was conceived, it helps to go back in time and consider what people thought about the natural world before Charles Darwin came along. The Judeo-Christian view of the world held that Earth was quite young, approximately 6,000 years old. During the 17th century, Sir Bishop Usher postulated that the Earth was created on Sunday, October 23rd in 4004 BC. In their view, God had created all species and these species were unchangeable or immutable. However, scientists in the 18th and 19th century began to question this way of thinking. 
they began to collect evidence that, in fact, Earth was quite old, millions of years old, and that both Earth's surface and its plant and animals have changed considerably over time. Evidence for these revolutionary ideas came from many different scientific arenas. We will look at how Darwin was influenced by new discoveries in the following sciences. Geology, which is a study of Earth and its processes. Paleontology, the study of fossils. Taxonomy and systematics, the study of organisms, their classification and relationships to one another. Demography, the study of populations. And evolutionary biology, the study of how organisms change over time. We will explore next the discovery of scientists who lived hundreds of years ago. Why are we doing this? Well, there is little doubt that someone eventually would have come up with the idea of natural selection. But if it were not for the scientists we are about to meet, there is little chance that Charles Darwin would have discovered natural selection. Our species has figured out that the planet Earth is 4.6 billion years. This is a remarkable achievement. But of course, we have not always known this. In fact, in the 1600s, any suggestions that Earth was more than just a few thousand years old was considered not only incorrect, but blasphemous. However, this way of thinking began to change in the 18th century, thanks in part to the work of the Scottish geologist James Hutton, shown in the upper left image. Hutton recognized that wind and rain caused erosion and formed sand, small rocks, and soil. Well, these particles could then be redeposited and form the layered pattern, a rock we call strata, as shown so beautifully in the bottom image here of uh, Utah's Bryce Canyon. However, a few thousand years was simply not enough time for this process to occur. It would require millions of years. Hutton's ideas of geological strata and time depth rely on the assumption that the processes that occur today are the same ones that have occurred in the past. This is known as uniformitarianism, an idea that is widely accepted in all scientific fields today. Hutton's ideas were soon tested by the great geologist Charles Lyell, shown in the upper right, who confirmed that it would take millions, not thousands of years, for Earth's geological strata to form. Not only is Earth old, some organisms that once populated Earth no longer exist. In fact, most of the life that has ever existed on our planet has become extinct. So how do we know it existed at all? Fossils. Robert Hooke, shown in the top image, invented the microscope and examined fossil wood under his new device. He noted that the cellular structure of the fossil wood was the same as wood that exists today. In other words, he discovered that fossils were the remains of things that were once alive. Over 100 years later, the French naturalist Georges Cuvier, shown below, made two other important observations. First, he proposed that fossils were from organisms that no longer existed. For instance, the fossil jaws shown here were not from elephants, but from extinct elephant-like creatures called mammoths. This idea, which sounds quite obvious today, was not at all obvious at the time. Many thought that extinction was impossible because each organism was divinely created. Cuvier also discovered that different fossils could be found in different geological strata. If geological strata were layered by age, with the older sediments deeper and the younger ones more superficial, then the different fossils in the different layers of rock could demonstrate if geological strata were layered by age, with the older sediments deeper and the younger ones more superficial, then the different fossils in the different layers of the rock could demonstrate evolutionary change. Of course, we employ this rationale today, but Cuvier did not. Instead, he proposed that the different layers represented groups of organisms that had been wiped out in a series of catastrophic events. Following Cuvier, many paleontologists suggested that extinction occurred slowly and gradually, like evolution itself. It did not happen catastrophically as Cuvier imagined. However, there is recent evidence that Cuvier may have been onto something with his ideas. Although many lineage extinctions are not dramatic, 
there is growing evidence that there have been mass extinction events. One such event happened 65 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous. It marks the end of the dinosaurs and the beginning of the reign of mammals. In 1991, researchers discovered a massive crater partially underwater on the Yucatan Peninsula in modern-day Mexico. It had been dated to about 65 million years and preserves a high concentration of iridium, an element that is extremely rare on Earth, but common in meteors and comets. A comet or meteor roughly six miles wide struck Earth 65 million years ago with a force of 100 million megatons. To put this into perspective, the current arsenal of nuclear weapons stockpiled by the United States military is 1,400 megatons. This means that we need to set off our entire nuclear arsenal 70,000 times in a row to equal the force of this impact. This was a catastrophic event, and it is remarkable that anything survived. Let's resume with an examination of the lineages that did not survive such an event. Prior to Cuvier's work on fossils, the great Swedish naturalist Carolus Linnaeus devised a system for naming and classifying all different organisms. His system is still used today and allows scientists from all over the world speaking different languages to understand one another. Linnaeus proposed that each species could receive a unique name composed of a genus and species. For instance, humans are Homo sapiens. Chimpanzees are pan troglodytes. Some of these names are familiar to you. The snake boa constrictor has the Linnaeus classification boa constrictor, and the gorilla is gorilla gorilla. Linnaeus also devised a hierarchical classification scheme in which all living organisms could be placed within a kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and finally, species. The Linnaean system of classification reveals that living organisms, including humans, are clustered in distinct ways, ways that could only be explained if these living organisms shared a common ancestor. Let's look at this in more detail using the human as an example. Let's work from the bottom up. Humans, as already discussed, are Homo sapiens. We are the only living members of our genus Homo although other species in this genus are known from fossils. We are members of the family Homomidae and the superfamily Homomidea. However, we are not alone in this superfamily. Chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons are also in the superfamily Homomidea. They are in this superfamily because they share features with us like large brains, mobile shoulders, and an upright posture. What is important to recognize here is that this is not a coincidence. These other animals reside in our superfamily because we share a common ancestor with them. However, Linnaeus didn't know this. We are in the infraorder Anthropodiae, along with the monkeys and the order primates. Even Linnaeus recognized that humans were primates, not because he had access to DNA, which he did not, but because we share a number of physical features. We are in the class Mammalia because we have body hair and nurse our young with milk. Again, this is not a coincidence. We are mammals and share features with other mammals because we share a common ancestor with other mammals. Our vertebral column puts us in the phylum Chordata with fish, frogs, and all other vertebrates. We reside in the kingdom Animalia with all other multicellular organisms that consume other organisms for food. At this level, we are related to sponges and fruit flies. Make sure you recognize the importance of this pattern of nested hierarchies. This pattern of life on Earth is precisely what one would expect if life has evolved from common ancestry through time. In other words, Linnaeus' work led Darwin to recognize that if all life was separately and divinely created, it was done so in a manner that completely mimics descent with modification or evolution. But how do complex organisms change over time? How do they evolve? Darwin's great insight of natural selection was strongly influenced, oddly enough, by an economist. Thomas Malthus, shown in the upper left, 
wrote an essay on the principle of population, a book that laid the foundation for many of Darwin's ideas. Malthus observed that humans often have more than two offspring. If parents, two people, continue to have more than two children, then the population of humans would grow. In fact, Malthus argued that the growth could be exponential, resulting in billions and billions of humans in a short period of time. Although Malthus observed population growth in the crowded urban centers of the 1800s, such as London, shown here at the bottom left, human population did not grow without limit. Why not? Malthus observed that the population of humans grows more slowly than expected because there is not enough food for everyone. Populations are limited by their resources. Therefore, there is a struggle for existence with only certain individuals surviving and reproducing. Notice how this observation by Malthus combined with Darwin's recognition that there is considerable variation in a population forms the basis of natural selection. It is a common misunderstanding that Charles Darwin invented evolution. But the idea that living organisms have changed over time was already around by the time Darwin came around. Most notably, the French scientist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck argued that plants and animals had changed over time or evolved. Even Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus, thought that species have changed over time. If scientists before Darwin had already discovered that species can evolve, why is Darwin so famous? What Darwin contributed to science was not just the evidence that life on Earth had evolved. He proposed a mechanism for how this can happen, natural selection. Lamarck also proposed a mechanism, inheritance of acquired characteristics. But this mechanism has been shown to be incorrect. Here's how Lamarck's version of evolution works. Giraffes once had a short-necked ancestor. In order to reach higher and higher branches, giraffes stretch their necks. Adult giraffes who have stretched out their necks will pass on this acquired feature of the long neck to their offspring. Over time, necks get longer and longer in the giraffe lineage. Now compare this to Darwin's mechanism, natural selection. There is variation in an ancient giraffe population, with some individuals having longer necks than others. They all feed on high branches. Those with longer necks eat, survive, reproduce, and pass on the trait of a long neck to the next generation. Those with shorter necks cannot reach as much food, are weak, and may even starve to death. The frequency of long-necked individuals in the population increases over time. After his voyage on the Beagle, Darwin spent the next several decades on an intellectual voyage. Unlike his first trip, this one took place almost entirely in one place, the study in his home, Down House in Kent, England, shown here in the upper right. There, Darwin did many experiments, collected vast amounts of evidence, and eventually organized his thoughts into a book on the origins of species. In this book, Darwin proposed natural selection as the mechanisms of evolution. As we have seen from the work done by the great geologists Hutton and Lyell, Darwin knew that Earth was quite old and that natural processes often occur in a gradual manner. Darwin read the work of Cuvier and recognized that many of the fossils that he collected while sailing around the world resembled living forms. From Malthus, Darwin began to recognize the importance of reproduction, variation, and population level thinking. And from Linnaeus and Lamarck, Darwin realized that life was clustered into related, nested hierarchies and that it had changed over time. These ideas led to his two great realizations. First, all life on Earth is related through common ancestry. More related organisms share a more recent common ancestor. And second, the mechanisms for evolutionary change is natural selection. All he had to do now was publish these ideas. In 1858, Charles Darwin received a startling letter from the naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace, shown here on the right. Like Darwin, Wallace made wonderful observations about the natural world and wondered why living organisms looked as they did. 
Also like Darwin, Wallace made many of his observations on islands, in Wallace's case, in Indonesia. Wallace collected many samples, read the works of Lyell and Cuvier, and thought deeply about the mechanisms of evolutionary change. In 1858, Wallace wrote to Darwin and proposed a mechanism for evolution that was strikingly similar to Darwin's own ideas. They agreed to jointly represent their findings to the Linnaean Society of London in July 1858. However, it is Darwin who went on to write on the origin of the species, which presented the details of natural selection and the evidence for evolution the following year. You can see the handwritten title page is shown at the bottom left. The fact that two scientists, working independently and on opposite sides of the world, both came up with the same mechanism for evolution, is robust evidence that natural selection is a powerful tool for explaining the pattern of life. You should now be able to see that Darwin's theory of evolution by means of natural selection did not emerge out of nowhere. On this slide is a timeline of events from Darwin's childhood right through his voyage on the Beagle to his intellectual voyage in the downhouse that resulted in the publication of one of the most profound books ever written. Be sure you understand these events and how science works. We always build on the ideas of our predecessors by asking questions, investigating unknowns, and challenging untested assumptions. Let's get back to the mechanism of evolution, natural selection. Natural selection can only operate if there is variation. If every member of a species is the same size, or the same color, or has the same size beaks, then how can certain individuals survive over others? Variation is a fundamental tenet of natural selection. But this raises new questions. Where does variation come from? Why do individuals in a species look a bit different from one another? And why do closely related individuals look more similar to each other? Darwin and other scientists recognized that offspring look like their parents. However, it was not known how this actually happens. Clearly something gets handed down from the parents to the offspring, but what? And how does this work? During Darwin's time, it was thought that offspring were a 50-50 blend of their parents. This idea, known as blended inheritance, was quite a problem for natural selection because it would dilute favorable adaptations, limiting the power of selection to cause evolutionary change. Little did Darwin know that an Augustian monk named Gregor Mendel was doing experiments with pea plants that would refute the ideas of blending inheritance and lay the foundation for modern genetics. Mendel bred over 28,000 pea plants and very carefully mapped how traits like flower color and position pea color and shape and plant height pass from one generation to generation. He discovered that traits were inherited discreetly through units ultimately called genes. These genes came in different versions called alleles. Often one version could exert dominance over another version that would be called recessive. The two versions, one for the mother and one from the father, did not blend. Let's look at this in more detail. Shown on the slide is a way to model a crossbreeding experiment called a Punit square. Imagine that Mendel breeds a tall plant at the top right of the square with a short one along the left side of the square. According to the ideas of blending inheritance, all of the offspring should be intermediate in height. But that is not what Mendel found. Imagine that the tall plant has two versions of the tall allele which we'll call Big T. The small plant has two versions of the, of the small allele, which we'll call Little T. When these plants reproduce, one allele is passed on from the maternal line and another from the paternal line. This would result in all possible offspring having the same combination of alleles, one Big T and one Little T. But instead of these being plants of intermediate height, Mendel found all these plants to be tall. Allele big T is dominant over the little t. Now let's breed these plants together and examine all of the different combinations of alleles in the offspring. 
One will have a big T from the mother plant and a big T from the father plant. Two plants will have a mixture of alleles, one big T and one little T. And one plant will have two little T alleles. Mendel bred thousands of plants and found that the ratio was approximately 25% to two dominant big alleles, 50% mixed alleles, and 25% two little recessive alleles. But Mendel could not see the alleles themselves. All he could see was their effect on the organism. What he saw was that three out of every four plants, or 75% were tall, and 25% were small. There was no in-between. Tall, which we call the phenotype, had the allele combination of either two big T's or one big T and one little T, which we call the genotype. The small ones could only have the genotype TT, or two little T's, because little T is recessive. We'll go into this in more detail in a later chapter, but the point here is that Mendel's work showed how inheritance works. Unfortunately, Mendel's work went unnoticed until after his death, when three botanists independently rediscovered Mendel's work and replicated his findings. Mendel's work on inheritance provides an understanding of how variation arises and is passed from generation to generation. Darwin's work provides an understanding of how that variation leads to differential survival and reproduction. Together, these two big ideas of inheritance and natural selection can be combined into an evolutionary synthesis. An understanding of both genetics and evolutionary processes helps us answer questions such as, why do genes change in frequency? And how do the total sum of genes, the so-called gene pool, vary within and across populations? This latter question has led to an entirely new field of science known as population genetics. You may have noticed that Mendel worked out how genes can be reshuffled from generation to generation, but how did these new genes first appear? Where did these come from? The answer was provided by the great biologist Thomas Hunt Morgan, shown here at the top left. Morgan worked with fruit flies and was particularly interested in their chromosomes, as shown in the upper right. Morgan discovered that a gene could change spontaneously, something called a mutation. A mutation could lead to a new variant, like the different eye colors shown in the bottom left or the four-winged fly shown to the right in this slide. If beneficial, this mutation could spread to future generations, making mutation an important cause of evolutionary change. In addition to natural selection and mutation, two other processes can cause a change in a, in a population over time. In other words, evolution. These processes are called gene flow and genetic drift. Gene flow is the spread of genes from one gene pool to another. It is also known as admixture. This process can introduce variants into a population that were previously either quite rare or absent altogether. For instance, the gene that causes sickle cell anemia is more common in people from the western part of Africa, where approximately 10% of them have the gene, compared to people from northern Europe, where nobody has it. In the last few hundred years, the United States has been populated by people from both parts of the world, and these populations have, have had children. Now, the sickle cell gene has flowed between populations, resulting in about 5% of African Americans and white Americans having the sickle cell gene. Yet another cause of evolution is genetic drift. Genetic drift occurs when populations are quite small and gene frequencies change because of a random drifting effect. In the example shown here, there are two populations of fish, a small, sparsely populated one, and a large one. The small population happens to have a single red fish along with five goldfish. The larger population has a more even mixture of the different fish with about one third of the total colored red. Imagine that, just by chance, the two populations of fish lose a red individual. The large population will change very little, going from a frequency of 33.3% to 32.8%. However, 
A smaller population has dramatic change in the gene pool, going from 16.6 red representation to zero. The only way to get a redfish back into the population would be through mutation and subsequent selection or gene flow from the larger pool. If these two populations become separated from each other, they may very well evolve into different fish species, one with a red variant, the other without. What makes a fish red or yellow? What exactly does it mean to have the gene for sickle cell anemia? We will explore these questions in the next chapter. For now, it is important to understand that natural selection that acts on many traits are coded for by genes. Genes are discrete units packaged on things called chromosomes, which reside in the nucleus of your cells. These chromosomes are made in part of a chemical called deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. And we can see a model for this on the upper right of this slide. In 1953, the British scientists James Watson and Francis Crick, here at the top left, using detailed microscopic images taken by Rosalind Franklin, here at the bottom right, discovered the structure of DNA and that it is a structure that helps reveal how DNA works. Following this discovery, scientists have figured out how the DNA molecule codes for particular traits or phenotypes. And it is a structure of the molecule that helps explain how we each have a copy of DNA in all of our trillions of cells. Scientists have also been able to count up the differences in the DNA code between different species to estimate how closely related different organisms are and how long ago they shared a common ancestor. This is possible because all life, from humans to chimpanzees, dogs, mice, fish, mushrooms, and bananas, contain a DNA code written in the same chemical alphabet. Although the focus of this class will be on how our understanding of DNA helps us understand human variation and human evolution, it is also quite relevant and important to recognize how our understanding of DNA has led to medical breakthroughs. As we will soon see, genes are simply codes for making proteins, but sometimes a code can be mutated, and this can result in a faulty protein. Sometimes a disease can result. Therefore, identifying the genes that predispose an individual to certain diseases has been a focus of medical research in the last decade. Illustrated in this slide are the 23 human chromosomes, and physically, where the genes that are related to specific diseases reside on each chromosome. A gene related to Lou Gehrig's disease has been found on chromosome 21. A gene that predisposes individuals to colon cancer is on chromosome 2. A gene found in individuals with Huntington's disease is found on chromosome 4. Note that in most cases, these genes do not cause a disease. Instead, the particular form of the gene may predispose an individual to that particular illness. As we will soon see, genes are complicated and even more interesting than Mendel, Morgan, or even Watson and Crick realized.